Good. Record. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the uh, what is often the oddest Sunday of the year. It's not Christmas, but it's still Christmas, and it's Christmas until Epiphany, which is next Sunday, so we're in the middle of Christmas, but it sort of feels like Christmas is over, and yet it sort of feels like Christmas is still going on, so it's a very odd, odd Sunday. Uh, traditionally, in multi-staff churches, this is called Youth Pastor Preaches Sunday. <laughs> Because the senior pastor takes the Sunday off and, the, ah, he can preach. It'll be fine. So, but uh, in this case, it's Dan's with you Sunday. So I'm glad you're here this morning as we worship together. Uh, the Christmas Eve service is just in the finishing processes of processing. So if you uh, didn't watch it on uh, the live stream, it'll be on YouTube within the hour. So if you want to watch, pick up the Christmas Eve service and catch that as well. But many of you are here for that as well. So I trust you had a, a quiet and beneficial Christmas. We ate turkey and stared at the dog. I think that was pretty much our Christmas. So it was, uh, it was a quiet Christmas, but it was good. But we're a praying people. So look around the room, wherever you are, uh, and take a moment and let's pray for one another. Father, as we gather here or wherever we are, whether we're by ourselves or with uh, our immediate family, we gather in your name, we gather in your presence. That time, space, and distance cannot separate us from you, nor ultimately from each other. That your spirit connects each one of us. So whether we are gathered in body or gathered in spirit, we are gathered in one name. The precious name of the one who loved us and gave his life for us. And in the simplicity and the peace of this place, we gather. In the simplicity and peace of our homes, we gather united in one spirit. We thank you that we can worship this morning. Thank you for the gifts you have given us through your Son, the peace and the hope we can know through Jesus. And it's in his name, even now as he prays for us, we gather. Amen. We gather together to sing. I invite you to stand as we worship together.
better on this one. <laughs>
6. And it says this, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. working for him, but that's not the call. The call is to work with him and him with us. And so as we go to prayer this morning, that's our prayer, that God would be with us in all that we do, wherever we go, that God would be with our governments, that God would be with our teachers, wherever, that God's presence would be known. The very purpose of Christmas was Emmanuel. So I'm going to pray for a little bit, and then uh, you're going to hear me pause and that little pause is then your cue to join with me. We haven't prayed the Lord's Prayer together for a long time. Uh, to join us as we together kind of end this year together, or begin this year, depends on how you look at today, uh, in prayer together. Let's pray. Father, as we gather before you, I'm always reminded that we gather with the four and twenty elders before the sea of glass before the myriad upon myriad of angels who are even now crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And our little voices in this peaceful place join with that overwhelming crowd. And we with them make the pillars of the temple shake for your glory. Father, this year it's been hard to see your glory at certain places and times as we have faced new things and struggled in ways we haven't before, as we have lost loved ones, seen our parents and our families struggle. We think of Violet as she continues to mourn the loss of Lawrence, and for others who are facing sickness and the challenges of life. Father, it's hard to sometimes see your glory, but I pray that in this day and the days to come that your glory would be revealed in us and through us and around us 
those little moments and those great moments when we see your hand, that you are truly with us. So we pray this morning. We seek your face that you would be with our leaders, with those who make decisions, that you'd be with our healthcare workers, with our teachers, with our first responders, with everyone this day, and that they in turn would have eyes to see that it is you who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords over all things, that you are Emmanuel, that this world is not chance and circumstance, a strange roll of the dice, but it is your sovereign hand over all things, and that gives us hope. It is your sovereignty, your presence, that gives us hope in all things. So, Father, together as your people, this day we cry simply, be with us for all these days. And now we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please stand once again.
Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> the story of Christmas. Jesus and the wise men. This is Jesus. Jesus is the son of God who would grow up to do amazing things. His parents on earth were Mary Hi. and Joseph. Hello. Jesus was born in a barn because there was no room for him anywhere else in Bethlehem. Bethlehem was part of Judea, an area that was ruled by a king named Herod. King Herod was in Jerusalem when some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, Let's go, man. Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose and we have come to worship him. When Herod heard that there was another king born in Judea, he was very upset. As was everyone else in Jerusalem. Yeah, not you. So Herod called all the important priests and Jews together and asked them where this king was supposed to be born. The Jews knew that their king would eventually come and was always told to them that the king of the Jews, the savior of the world, would be born in Bethlehem. So they told that to King Herod. Then King Herod thought of a way to trick the wise men. So he called a private meeting with them and learned from them when the king of the Jews star first appeared. Oh God! And then King Herod told the wise men, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me, so that I can go and worship him too. Eh, okay. Hey, I'm right. But secretly, Herod wanted to know where the king of the Jews was, so he could get rid of him. So the wise men went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where Jesus was, and the wise men were filled with joy. Woo-hoo! They went into the house and saw Mary and Jesus. Hello! Oh, look! Wow! And they bowed down and worshipped Jesus. Wait! They gave him special gifts fit for the king that he was. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then God warned them in a dream to not go home through Jerusalem, where King Herod was. But God told them to go home a different way. So they did. And then an angel appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up! The angel told Joseph to go to Egypt with Mary and Jesus because Herod was looking to kill Jesus. That very night, Joseph left for Egypt with Jesus and Mary. They stayed in Egypt until Herod was gone and it was safe for them to go home to Israel. When they returned, an angel warned them about the new ruler of Judea, who was Herod's son. This way. So Joseph and his family went to the region of Galilee and found their new home in the town of Nazareth. Look good? Yep. Okay. Where Jesus would grow up and eventually do all the amazing things God had planned for him to do. Give me one of those Herod hats. It kind of looked like the upside down cup or the top of a chess piece, or I'm not sure which. Well, as I said earlier on, this is the uh, sorry, missed the pulpit. The oddest of Sundays, because we're kind of in between things and people have come and gone and back and forth. So we're going to take a little break from the book of Galatians and turn to... Wes was concerned when I laid out five felt markers. He thought, it's going to be a long morning if you plan on using all those up. But uh, So I'm just going to swing this over. We're going to do something different this morning. And uh, hopefully the camera will be able to... I'll print in large letters. Camera will be able to pick up, and everybody at the back can see. How's your eyes, Dylan? You're good? All right, good. I'll, I'll print in large letters. 
We live in a world of symbols and signs. Marketing, advertising, promotions, logos, identities, IDs. I suspect if we looked at the clothes you were wearing this morning, they'd probably be an ID. Mine's made the Hudson Bay Company. I have no idea how old this coat is. I bought it at the thrift store when uh, we were in college the first time. So I, it's, it's old. But, uh, Donna got me a shirt this Christmas, and the brand is Rock and Roll Cowboy. I, I like that. It's a good brand. Jack, you got to get into the Rock and Roll Cowboy. It's a whole other level of cowboy. That, uh, it's Pink Paisley. So some Sunday when I'm really feeling daring, and we have all men's Paisley Sunday journey. You up for it? We'll all wear Paisley, man. And uh, I'll throw my Pink Paisley shirt on. But uh, Rock and Roll Cowboy, what a brand. But signs are important. We wouldn't know uh, necessarily where to drive, where to turn. They guide us, direct us. They point the way. They tell us where to go. Our story was Epiphany. And a star came and guided them and led them. That, uh, why does a shirt fit when you put it on, but once you start talking, it gets too tight? That. Christmas story is full of signs. Angels come and give them messages, stars, and onward. In business, Signs and symbols are absolutely essential. Imagine a world where your company had no logo, <laughs> had no sign, no brand. How would you know who to be loyal to anywhere? So this is like my third try on half. Thanks, Wes. <laughs> now I want us to understand though, there's a difference between a sign and a symbol. And that will become crucial as we talk early, or get into the biblical content of the message. So we have to establish this understanding. First off, a sign gives us a direction to a reality. It tells us where to go. It may have no connection with the reality it's pointing us to. So a sign is about direction and information, but not necessarily connected to the reality of that information or that action. This will all be clear in a moment. Think about a yield sign. A triangle has no connection with slowing down. You, know, you, you don't think slow down. Now you've been trained to think that way, or hopefully your driver's ed instructor. But the yield sign has no physical connection to oncoming traffic. A triangle has nothing to do with yielding. A triangle really doesn't mean anything more than three equal sides. So a sign is information pointing us to something without a connection necessarily to that reality. But a symbol is less about direction and more about identity. It represents the thing and in some ways has a, a metaphoric or a visual connection to the object it's speaking to. So you think about, you know, the, the Nike whoosh is a symbol of speed, right? You can see the curve, you can see it go by. Uh, Yamaha's symbol is three tuning forks all connected together because originally the company made musical instruments and they still do to this day. So there's some kind of physical representation of the object, the identity, the people, the corporation is pointing to. So many of you this morning wear a wedding ring, right? That's a symbol of eternity, the idea of love going round and round and never stopping. Uh, we wear it on the middle, on the ring finger of our left hand because that's the shortest vein to our heart. So it's the quickest path to our heart. So the idea is that it's closest to our heart. Um, it is a symbol, an expression of that reality. Countries have symbols. Uh, what is the official bird of the United States? Eagle. The eagle, right? Proud and brave, you know, flying with great wings. Good. Uh, the official animal of Great Britain? A lion, right? The, the lion that's there, or maybe a bulldog, you know, staunch and sturdy. These are great national symbols. Uh, Canada's official animal? Neither. Right, a large rodent that uh, barrels <laughs> underground. Russia has the bear. You know, we've got a, a beaver, which is fairly easy to trap and kill. Uh, but it's a good, hardworking, keeps its head down, good in the cold. You know, it's a, it's a great symbol for our country. It's just kind of ironic. That, uh, so symbols are the daily visible reminders of invisible realities. Let me say it again. Symbols are daily visible reminders of invisible realities. 
So is it any wonder for us then that scripture is rich in both sign and symbol? There are signs that point us, but also symbols that remind us. So the uh, rainbow in Noah, what is that a sign of or a symbol of? The promise that God would never flood the earth again, right? Doesn't have a lot to, well it does connect to water, right? Uh, the blood on the doorpost at Passover, that the blood, the angel of death would pass over, that the blood of the lamb had been sp uh, spilled, a very direct symbol connected to that reality. So far more a symbol than a sign. Uh, the clothing of the priests, their garments were rich in symbolism and sign, and the entire sacrificial system is rich in symbol and sign, oil, blood, water, sheep, goats, all these are connected. But there's one that we don't often think about. Turn with me in your Bibles to Numbers chapter 15. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Numbers. Numbers 15. Numbers 15, starting in the 37th verse. Numbers 15, verse 37. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, Throughout the generations to come, you are to make tassels on the corners of your garment with a blue cord on each tassel. So they would have a, a square shawl or a robe, and on each corner of that robe or that shawl, there would be a blue tassel. You will have these tassels to look at, and you will remember all the commands of the Lord. So this isn't so much a symbol as this is a sign. It's a sign of the commandments of God and that you will, you may obey them and not prostitute yourselves by chasing after the lusts of your own hearts and eyes. Then you will remember to obey all my commands and will be consecrated to the Lord your God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. We talked about this on Wednesday night Bible study and it was that little conversation that cued this message. But blue tassels on the four corners of your garments. This would be a symbol of your connection between heaven and earth. So I want you to imagine you've got these on your robe um, and if it was just, let's say a string, it wouldn't be big enough. But tassels do what when you walk? They move, right? And so out of the corner of your eye, you would constantly see movement. And when our eyes are conditioned, that when we see movement, we pay attention, right? And so this idea that as you're walking along, as you're working, this tassel would move in the wind or move with your pace. And every time you saw it, you were to remember the Lord your God. It was a memory tool to help us remember who God is. Uh, the reason it was on the corners was a reminder of the four corners, the anchor points of the earth. The four corners of the garments would symbolize the four corners of the earth. Well, we know the earth isn't square, but that symbol, right? And that the earth was connected and belonged to God, that you and I, they belonged to God. Now, this tassel would become an issue later on. It would become a symbol of pride. By the time we get into Jesus' day in Matthew 23, 5, Jesus writes, or Jesus says, everything they do is for people to see. They make their phylacteries, these bands wide, and the tassels of their garments long. So what were the Pharisees doing? It wasn't enough just to have a two or three. It, they would have these great, long, beautiful silk tassels so everyone would know how you know, religious and righteous they were. So it became a problem. We had the ability to abuse anything. And why blue, though? Blue tassels. Well, the high priest wore a blue ephod robe and blue lace on his mitre. God prescribed blue cloth covering several of the tabernacle's furnishings. The tabernacle and the entrance of the Holy of Holies was one third blue. And when Ezekiel sees God in his throne in Ezekiel 1.26, it says, and above the firmaments over the heads was the likeness of the throne in the appearance like sapphire. God's throne is blue. And so blue is God's color. You know, green is for the riders. God likes blue. And blue is a symbol of God's throne, of God's presence, that he was there. And when you saw blue, you were to remember God. So blue has been adopted into our culture. If someone's honest, they're true blue. If you win first prize, you get a blue ribbon. 
If you want to know what your car is worth, you look for the blue book value, whenever it's the true. And when we mean business in business, what color do we wear? We wear blue, because power and money still wear blue, a blue suit. So blue has become into our language and into our culture of honesty, integrity, reward, value, and earnestness. Blue is still the true color. So this symbol, though, keeps moving, and this reality of the blue tassels exists in Jesus' day. By the time we get to Jesus, he is wearing blue tassels. We see this in Matthew 9, verse 20 and 22. And the woman who had been suffering from a hemorrhage for 12 years came up behind him and touched, your Bible may say fringe, but the word there is tassel, the tassels of his cloak. For she was saying to herself, if I only touch his garment, I will get well. So she reaches up and touches the symbol of God, his authority that he had. We see this in Matthew 14, 26. And when they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized him, they sent word into all the surrounding districts and brought to him all who were sick. And they implored him that they might just touch the tassels of his cloak and be made whole. That, the word fringe or hem or border there is the translation of the word tassel. And so they would touch the tassels of Jesus' robes and would be made whole. Jesus honored the law. And so we see blue as God's color, as the four corners of the earth, the four corners of God's authority, all being contained within Jewish tradition and Jesus honoring that tradition. So if you want to make yourself a blue tassel, I would encourage you to do so. We'll talk about that in a minute. It's not a bad thing. So we see the Old Testament rich in sign and symbols, right down to blue tassels. And by the time we get into the New Testament, this symbolism continues. The Holy Spirit comes in a symbol or a form of a dove, right? And we have that symbol today. We have the symbol of baptism, of being immersed in the water, dying to self and being made new and rising to Christ. We have the symbol of the Lamb. In Revelation, Jesus says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. That's the first and the last letters of the Greek alphabet. He says, I'm the first and the last. I'm the A to Z of all creation. We see Jesus as the Good Shepherd. We see him as the door, the loving Father, all these symbols of him. We see the Spirit's presence of oil. And of course, the most famous symbol or sign of all Christendom, the cross. At Christmas, the angels say this in Luke 2.12, This will be a sign, and you will find the baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. The first sign of Christ. So as the early church progresses throughout its history, it becomes and it creates this visual language of sign and symbol. Now we have to remember that most people in the early church were illiterate, and so they grabbed a hold of signs and symbols to express their faith. Hebrews 8 19 says, We have this hope as an anchor for the soul. And so, one of the earliest Christian signs was an anchor. You can buy these little uh, faith, hope, and love charms, and you'll get an ankle, an ankle, an anchor, and a heart, and what's the one for a cross? Um, the butterfly very quickly became a symbol of Christendom. It's a symbol of the resurrection. We get the shepherd's crook, that is, the good shepherd. We get the eagle, and if you go back to old uh, English churches, you will see the Bible is placed on a, on a podium in the shape of an eagle because the serpent would be destroyed. The eagle would swoop down and would destroy the serpent. So the word is seen as a great taloned eagle. And as Christianity spread through Europe, symbolism went all over the European imagery. We get dolphins and pelicans and peacocks. All these become symbols of our faith. But the earliest, besides the cross, was this one. And I'll do it nice and large. Can you see over there, Bonnie and Brad? Am I, or should I angle it a bit? You're, you're good? You're good? Okay. How's that? What's that? He's a fish. Very good, yeah. Um, this was the, one of the earliest symbols of Christendom. Christianity was a persecuted faith, and when believers would meet, they would just start talking, like 
on the street, you know, just kind of talking about whatever people talk about. And one person would just kind of drag their foot through the dust. And if the other person did nothing, they'd go, oh, we're all good. But if the other person turned and dragged the opposite half of the curve, then you'd know you're talking to a Christian. It was a sign of safety. So very easy. So next time you're at Subway, Doug, just take a little salt and pour half a curve and see what happens. If no one gets it, you'll be fine. But uh, unlikely that anybody would get it. Now here's the fun part. I can erase this. You see that, Murray? All right. If you were to study ichthology at university, you would be studying fish. Ichthology. That's the word ichthus. That's the word fish. So a fish is a an ichthus. So you'd have ichthus and chips for supper. Is what you'd be doing. That's the word fish. So Christians were to follow the fishers of men. Right? Jesus performed the miracle of fish. So the fish became a very quick symbol of faith. But here is the best part. An acrostic is when we have the letters. C, C is for Christ, born on the manger. H is for happy, how I feel at Christmas. R is for the, you remember doing that as a kid? Had to gather the spell Christmas. All right, that's, that's the, that's, what do they call them? An acrostic, not a cross stitch, acrostic. All right, this is an I, it's an iota. I can never remember if it's this, oh, I think it's this one and this one, I'll get it right. It's been a while. I-S-O-U-S, Jesus. And if you watch baseball at all, who's Jesus? You can yell, by the way. That's Jesus, right? So that's the Greek word for Jesus, the Jesus, Jesus. Uh, when... When an S is at the end of the word, it's different. Sherry will get me, correct me. But um, this is Christos. That's a, called a, an XE. It's a CH in English. So, like, it's a good guttural, right? So, Christos, right? A Christos. And Christos is Christ. So, Jesus, Christ. That little fellow, the O with a smile in it, that's not really, it's just a little thing in the middle. That's Theos where we get the word theology. And theology, theos, is God. Theology is the study of God. So we have Jesus, Christ, God. Uyos, that's son. So, Brad, you're the Uyos of Murray. This is Jesus, Christ, God's son. And then, this is an S at the end here, Oh, uh, we'll do an end at the end just for it. That's soterion, savior. So soteriology is the study of salvation. So the acrostic for fish is Jesus Christ, God's Son, our Savior. It's a great symbol for Christendom. And Christendom was tied to that. And so the fish becomes one of the earliest symbols of Christendom. And it doesn't end there. Oh, I'm just going to flip this. Hey! All right. Now, here's the fun part. As if this just wasn't fun enough. <laughs> All right. If we take the I from aota, and we take... The X and the <laughs> from Christo, I'm not lining this up. Art is not my thing. And if we take the Theos, that's the theta. And then we take the Uyos, and it gets tucked right in the middle here like that. It's kind of like that part. That's the, the Uyos gets repeated, gets laid over top of the thing. And then if we take the S, there. And then if we add that little bar in the middle, what does that look like? A ship's wheel. And so the ship's wheel 
became a symbol of Christendom. So we have an anchor, firm and secure, but also we have the one who is, and so you'll see paintings of you know, the guy holding the ship's wheel, and the ship's wheel very, very quickly became a symbol of Christianity, and it was kind of a cloaked version of the word fish. Um, so this is Jesus Christ, God's Son, our Savior, the captain of our faith, as it were, the captain of our ship. So, so all these symbols were born together in Christendom. Only one marker. But there's one great symbol that we haven't talked about that we are going to share in next week. And that is the great symbol of our faith, communion. Jesus in Mark 6 says this, Very, very truly I tell you that unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day, for my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that comes down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. And so communion becomes the richest of all the great symbols of our faith. It is a symbol that Christ himself endorsed, instituted, that goes through the entire history of Israel, the Passover meal. And so we get his broken body as the Passover lamb. John 6, verse 5, Jesus says, I am, sorry, verse 51, Jesus says, I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, and I will give it for the life of the world. His, this bread is tied to the symbol of the Passover lamb, the broken body of the lamb, and the symbol of the lamb and the bread and Jesus' body are all brought into one great moment. And then, of course, his blood, symbolized within the sacrificial lamb. The blood of the lamb is sprinkled on the doorpost of the Hebrews in Egypt. Am I, somebody's phoning me, right? Well, thanks, Christina. This blood was symbolic of the fact that God would not bring judgment on his people, which he was bringing on the Egyptians. And so in the same way, the blood of Christ delivers us from judgment. And this great symbol points us in three great directions. It points us to the past, showing us what Jesus has done, that he died for us. It brings us into the present of what Jesus is doing. He is alive, working within us. And it takes us into the future of his second coming. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, but do this until I come. And so this symbol of the body and the blood, the lamb that was slain, points us to the past, to the present, and ultimately to the future. At the same time, it points us to three great relationships. Our union with Christ, we are with, united with him in his death and in his resurrection. Our union with one another in the room, that broken, shared bread, it's to be one loaf symbolically, and ultimately our union with Christians all over the world throughout time and history. So next week, we'll be sharing together the great symbol of our faith. So let me conclude with this. Should you wear a blue tassel, feel free. I don't think there's any prohibition against it. I think those are great reminders. It's a good, solid reminder, the glory and the authority of God. Should you glue a fish to your car? Well, that's up to you as well. Depends on how you drive. You might want to be careful with that one. You can if you want. Pelicans and peacocks and dolphins and ship's wheels and fish, all these great reminders. And I think they're important because we people, we tend to forget. And they're great little connectors to life, to who Christ is. I have a little tiny cross on my jacket. It's almost so small you can't even see it. This was from my great uncle from World War I. He wore it on his uniform during World War I, and it was passed down, passed down. So it's about 100 and, let's see, he, uh, 17 for sure, so we'll call it 103 years. A great little connection, right? Reminds me of my family, my heritage, of his faith, 
and today of my faith. I think they're good little things to have with us. I had a little old lady, she always wore cross earrings, and she said they would dangle and I would grab them and I'd rub them and I'd remember my Savior. They're not talismans, they're not magic, but they are simple reminders. We have the freedom to wear or not wear. But communion, we don't have that option. Communion is commanded. Do this in remembrance of me. So, if you're like me and you tend to forget, I encourage you, as you have the freedom and as you cho choose, to wear those little reminders. Whether it's a blue mask or a blue tassel, God's presence is with us. Let's pray. Father, sometimes we forget that you are with us. We forget Emmanuel. How easy it is in the busyness of our lives to forget. And you knew people would do that. You knew your children of Israel would be easily forgetting you. And so you commanded them repeatedly to carry about with them physical symbols of your authority, your presence. And to this day, you give us as a church great symbols of your presence. The way we do things. The cross that we carry. The words that we speak. And the communion that we share. Father, may we never forget who you are. And I pray this in Christ's good name. Amen. Let's close in song. We stand once again as we close.
This is my final benediction of 2020 and my prayer for you in the days to come. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all the generations forever and ever. Amen. God bless and we'll see you in 2021. Thank you.